Thanks very much. Um, thank you. I think I need this. Yeah, well. So yeah, I want to talk about I want to talk about um, stealing this morning, um, this afternoon, whatever. I can't remember the time. I'm still jet lagged. Um, it's something. It's a problem in the games business. It's something going on it, in education. There's lots of examples of it. Um, and what I want to talk about is the fact that I don't think we're doing enough to encourage it. Um, so my name is Matt Mason, and I, and I, I really support this statement. And I wrote a book which kind of gets into all the stuff going on with, with stealing in the context of digital and, and the transitions we're, we're making as our behavior changes. Um, and, and really, I think the kind of, in a nutshell, this is what's going on. Information used to be a, a one-way street. It, if you look at how all our forms of media worked, you used to have broadcasters here and receivers here or producers here and consumers here, and, and, and that, was, that was fine. But if you look at who we are, as what we, what we are as creatures, we're actually relentless copying machines. We copy. It's how we, it's how we learn to talk. It's how, we, it's how we learn. It's how we learn social norms, mannerisms, all these kinds of things. And all our media started to evolve, and now information's become a two-way street, where anybody can broadcast or receive anybody else's information, and it's causing all kinds of decentralization and democratization of lots of industries and businesses and organizational models. And a lot of people look at what's going on, and they're scared by this. They see piracy, a threat that we must stop at all costs. And there's a lot of um, really questionable things happening because of this, like the, the new digital economy bill, for example. And I, I support intellectual property as an idea. I think we need some, some reasonable measures of it. Um, I, I just want to say that at the start and be clear about that. But I think this problem is going to get a lot worse. I think we're nowhere near being through the woods with this. Let me give you just a sort of a, a, an idea of what, what might be in the future. Um, anybody know what one of these things is? This is called a 3D printer. Uh, what this does, it's kind of like a tiny factory. It can actually print out physical objects from C CAD designs. And, and the way it does it, it fuses together metals, ceramics, rubbers, starches, all, all kinds of materials, layer by layer, kind of like an inkjet printer would print words on paper. This just prints out physical objects. Um, and we've been using them in, in industrial design for a long, long time. People use them to print out concept cars, new product designs, architectural models. Um, all kinds of companies are using these things. And the thing about 3D printers, the reason I'm interested in them is because they're getting smaller and faster and more sophisticated uh, at really, really alarming rates, kind of the way computers did in the 70s. Um, this, this is a football boot made by a company here in London called Prior to Lever. And what they do, they scan, they scan your foot, and then they'll print out the perfect football boot for you. Th these are quite expensive. You pretty much have to be a professional soccer player to afford a pair of these. But like I said, things are really progressing. All the time, these things are getting smaller and cheaper. And people are predicting that soon we'll have 3D printers hooked up to the internet, and we'll be copying stuff at home. Well, you kind of, it's not hard to sort of see where things might go next. I mean, what, what's, what is a company like Nike or Adidas going to do when, when kids are downloading trainers at home? And Mark Getty, the founder of Getty Images, kind of summed this up. He said, intellectual property is going to be the oil of the 21st century. And what he meant by that is we're going to have wars over it. And I think we're, we're starting to see some, some of these things happen already with the sort of fight against piracy. And with things like 3D printing, it's just going to get, it's going to go to a whole new level in decades to come. Um, if, that, if, they're not, if that's not enough to sort of get your head around, think about this for a second. There's a professor at the University of Bath called Professor Adrian Bowyer who's developed a 3D printer that can actually print out a 3D printer. So the future is a scary place and copying and Stealing is, go is going to be more of a problem than it is today. But I don't think war's the answer, and I don't think pirates just create problems. If you look at history, they've also created something else. They've also created solutions, and are, are in fact some of the best innovators and one of the greatest and most amazing resources that I think we have on this planet. Um, I, I came to this conclusion at a, at a young age. I grew up here in London, obsessed with music, uh, particularly the music coming from the pirate radio stations that we have here in London. I'm, I'm sure you all know about pirate radio. 
It's been around since it's been around since the late fifties, and it's been a, a huge cultural force here. So, as, as soon as I could, as soon as I could carry a box of records, I had to become involved in pirate radio. I was I was a good kid at school. I didn't get in lots of trouble, but I had to go and do this. I didn't see it as as breaking the law. I saw it as community service, if you like. I, I saw it was a community I was part of, and I knew that it was it was adding value to my life as a teenager growing up here, and I wanted to be part of that. So I spent my weekends at the top of tab blocks like this, in little studios like this, playing playing all kinds of different music to to Londoners like myself. And um, the the police were out trying to catch us, and Ofcom and all the rest of it, but. The Metropolitan Police used to also advertise with the pirate radio station I played on. We, we had such a big audience that for Operation Trident and stuff like that, if they wanted to get through to young Londoners, the people they wanted to talk to were listening to pirate radio. So they valued it as much as, every, as, much as all the record labels used to advertise with us. They saw there was value in this even though it was illegal and it was their job to stop what we were doing. And it, it kind of works like this. You've got a legitimate market space sort of for radio being broadcast to young Londoners and you've got sort of two big companies that control the two big stations and then a couple of others as well and then the pirates are kind of over here and they've really there's sort of two different things going on in this space th these companies have large overheads and massive audiences and it costs millions of pounds to run run a radio station like KISS or Capital or Choice and so that sort of means you need large audiences and you need to be talking to advertisers a certain way and and to, to really work over here, you basically need to play the same 20 songs to people 20 times a day. But the pirates are in this different space where actually over here, the, the most popular pirates are the ones that are the most experimental and are breaking new records and new scenes and new sounds and, and all this kind of stuff. And, and so the pirates are really, they don't have the same overheads. They can take risks that these guys can't. So I innovation really happens over here. And when something becomes popular, a new record, a new, a new sound, a new DJ even, all, all KISS FM used to be a pirate, most of their DJs, a lot of their DJs are ex-pirates. Same thing with Capital, same thing with Choice. When DJs or records get popular, they're kind of funneled in to the mainstream. So you have the pull of money over here and innovation here. But these two systems really support each other. They kind of form this feedback loop. And I was obsessed with this growing up. I studied economics, and, and the economics of pirate radio was just really interesting to me because it was this illegal thing that was frowned upon, but it was really valuable part of the, the, whole, the whole ecosystem of, of music in the UK. Um, and, and I wrote a lot about this and was the founding editor of a magazine called Rewind, which is really about pirate culture, which is still around today. It does 70,000 copies a month. It's one of the biggest music magazines in the UK. And I left Rewind in 2005, and I decided that I wanted to write a book about this, this relationship and pirate culture, because it, for, for my life personally, it had always been a huge, a huge part of why, why life had been good. But I could see that piracy was being talked about in a different way, and I thought there was another side to this argument. So I, went, I started looking around at other things pirates had done, because, I mean, okay, radio, whatever, great. But when you really get into it, pirates have founded all kinds of... All kinds of new inventions and innovations. They've even in st started entire nations, like, um, like this one. This is Sealand. This is an old sea fort out in the English Channel, um, which, which was used to um, bomb the, was used to f uh, fire, fire gun, gun g fire, fire bullets? Right, bullets. At the Luftwaffe as they flew over to, to bomb London. And it, it, was, it was put out there during World War II and um, the army left it to rot, and they thought it would fall into the sea after, after the war, but it didn't. And pirate radio DJs started taking them over in the 60s and turning them into radio stations. And this one guy, uh, who called himself Prince Roy of Sealand, he noticed that this particular fort was actually in international waters. It was outside of, at the time, the UK boundary. And he studied dereliction laws, and he realized that if he claimed this as his own piece of land, he could actually start a new nation. So in 1966, he, he got onto this fort, and there were some other pirate DJs on there, and he threw them off, and he declared himself Prince Roy of Sealand. He added a helipad, and he hoisted a flag, moved in with his family, and he started printing coins and stamps and passports and, and started selling titles. You can, you can go on eBay right now and become a lord or lady of Sealand for, I think it's about 15 pounds. It's very reasonable. Um, <laughs> So this was pretty cool, and, and in, in 2000 they started a company called Haven Co., which was going to be the, the home of offshore 
data warehousing sort of outside of any, any other sort of international treaties or laws. Uh, unfortunately, Sealand was badly damaged in a fire in 2006 and is now up for sale, if anybody's interested. Um, but that wasn't the only nation that piracy was, had, been, had been founded by pirates and, and founded on piracy. When I, I started to look back through the history books, I found there were other ones, like, like this one, America. America was founded on piracy. If you go back to the Industrial Revolution, the Americans couldn't afford to, to buy European technology and, and patents and, and, and copyrights, and, and so they just decided to just copy things and ignore international IP laws, and that was the only reason America was able to industrialize as cheaply and as efficiently and as quickly as it did, and this used to annoy us Europeans so much that we began to refer to Americans as a young case, a, a Dutch slang word which, which meant pirate, which we today pronounce Yankees. And you go back through American history, you see all these examples of piracy at the birth of all these new inventions. This guy, Thomas Edison, invented the phonographic record player. When he did, live musicians branded him a pirate. Here was this guy with this funny machine that played plastic discs that totally reproduced what live musicians then did to earn a living. And they thought, well, if, if these machines were in every bar and venue in the, in the country, then we're out of business. And it was only until they just agreed on, on some terms with Edison that the record business and royalties and all these things really sort of came into being. And now when we look back on it, it was, it was very obviously an opportunity. Edison went on to invent filmmaking technology and, and he decided that he was going to charge filmmakers uh, a fee to, to use his technology. And a, a lot of filmmakers, including this man named William from New York, thought thought this fee was way too high, and he wanted to make films. He didn't want to pay this fee. So William left New York, and him and a bunch of other filmmakers fled to this small town um, on, on, the, on the then still very wild west coast of America, close enough to the Mexican border that if they heard that Edison was sending a team of lawyers out from New York to get them, uh, they'd, all, they'd all go and hide in Mexico. And they started this, this small town of pirate filmmakers making these pirate films that were free of licensing, and it did really well. It's still there today. It's called Hollywood. Um, William's second name, by the way, was Fox. So you go back through history, and it's, it's quite clear with hindsight that in a lot of times in our history, we've had these examples that seem like threats and problems, but actually they were just they were entire new industries growing. The problem now with the internet is we're seeing this problem that happened to the film business and the music business and all these others. It's happening to every every business and industry and, and type of organization and culture at once. Everything's changing at once. And we really, really need a better understanding of how, how this works, how stealing actually works. And just sort of to, to go through this, I want to talk about how Pirate Radio started here, because that, it's a really interesting story, and I think it really highlights why this can be a valuable thing. So here's Western Europe in the 1900s. And we really did not understand the value of radio at this point. In, in America, they, they got it. You play music, you give it to people for free, and you sell ads against it. It's a great business model, works really well. So the Americans were doing that, but not so in socialist Western Europe in the 1900s. Radio was a tool of the state. It was for broadcasting education and propaganda and kind of not much else. So it was illegal. Commercial radio was illegal here in the 1900s, everywhere except Luxembourg. Luxembourg thought actually this might be a good idea, there might be, might be an opportunity to do something good for Luxembourg here. So in, in 1933, they started Radio Luxembourg and they, they put up a radio antenna and started broadcasting. But th this antenna was actually the world's most powerful radio antenna at the time. So the signal covered Luxembourg really well, but it kind of got out a little bit further. And the rest of Western Europe started listening to, to music on Luxembourg and was like, well, this is a really good idea, and, and entrepreneurs started to get really frustrated in other countries. Like, well, why can't, why can't we start this thing? They're doing it in Luxembourg, they're doing it in America. And th this is kind of the difference between entrepreneurs who look for gaps, gaps in the market and, and pirates. Pirates look for the gaps outside the market, and usually for no other reason than they're going to make money by doing so, they go into these gaps and, and they start doing something they, they shouldn't be doing. And the big gap that everybody could see here was the English Channel. And so that's where all these pirates started going in the late 50s, early 60s. You had Radio London, which was on an old, an old fishing vessel. You had Radio Caroline, started by the Rolling Stones former manager. And then you had Prince Roy and our friends on the Seaforts. 
And they, all the pirates were broadcasting, and they were getting out so far that by the mid-60s, half of Britain was listening to rock and roll on Pirate Bay. This is the only reason we have rock and roll. We had rock and roll in Europe. And, and the governments were, were kind of scared by this. They, they didn't want to close down these pirate stations when half the country was listening to them. They, they feared riots or revolution. And so they did something that was actually quite smart. Instead of, instead of just going after the pirates and, and saying that what they were doing was wrong, the government started to legalize commercial radio and, start, and started to create an alternative framework in which radio could exist. And it wasn't really until the early 70s that they really started to legislate against, against the pirates. Radio London, the BBC went to them, poached all their best DJs and started a cheap imitation pirate copy of Radio London called Radio One. And, and it, was only when, it was only when there was a really good commercial framework in place did they start to legislate heavily against the pirates in the channel and, and they all moved uh, on land. So as I said, pirates do three things really, really well. They find these gaps outside of the market and rightly or wrongly, they go there. And they, they create a vehicle. It can, be a, it can be a pirate ship or it can be a town of filmmakers on the west coast of America. But they create something where the medium is also a message. It's also broadcasting something about how society is. So a, a pirate ship playing free music is also saying, well, we should, probably have, we should probably have commercial radio in Europe. It's probably a good idea. A pirate town of filmmakers is, is quite clearly sending a message that Edison's license fees suck and we'll be more creative if we don't have them. And really effective pirates, and this is really the difference between, I think, sort of good and bad piracy, if piracy is actually adding value to society, they'll get their audience behind them. They'll harness the power of people, despite governments, despite companies, and eventually the laws will have to bend to what the pirates are doing, because it's not really piracy at that point. It's just how people are behaving. So I, I think a piracy is a market signal. When you're seeing this kind of, this, this kind of thing happen at a, a massive level, if you look at the record business when it when back in the back in the late 90s when things like Napster hit these guys did not see this as as part of their business model it wasn't something that they wanted to really incorporate into what they were doing but actually it was a market signal that things were changing and that actually it, as Steve Jobs once said it, if you if you really want to stop piracy you've got to compete with it like the way the governments did with radio and and digital gradually took over, and it was jobs that started iTunes, and we all know what's going on now. I mean, it, it's quite clear that digital and iPods and all the rest of it has, has really added value to, to music. So, yeah, sometimes you should fight. If pirates are adding no value at all to what, what it is that you do, changing the laws and legislating against them and going after them it is a good idea. But if you're going after more people, if, if most people are doing this thing, it's really a losing battle. They, they're probably doing it for a reason. 95% of British kids are downloading music. And if you suddenly find that suing your customers is the core component of your business model, well, you don't really have a business model at that point, unless you're a lawyer. So, I mean, competing is, is something that we, we don't really think about, and we should be thinking about it in education. We should definitely be thinking about it in gaming, and I'm going to come to that in a minute. Why should we compete with pirates, and how, how do you do that? Well, the, the most obvious and the easiest way to compete with piracy is, is to copy them. When you see pirates doing something useful, just see where the value is and, and do it yourself. So this is happening in all of these industries which are under threat from from pirates. Take the, the pharmaceutical business. This is an industry where piracy really is a, a life or death situation. You've got these massive companies that um, spend lots of money developing new drugs, and then you've got lots of people, millions of people in countries all over the world who can't afford these new drugs and want them anyway because they're going to die. And so their governments, a lot of governments, just turn a blind eye to this the way the Americans did during the Industrial Revolution. And you can't really blame them. I mean, letting your, letting your voters die isn't really a vote winner. So Thailand, China, Brazil, Argentina, there's lots of countries that just totally ignore drug patents because it, it doesn't make any sense. And so the drug companies have really been struggling with this because they're here and, and people making knockoffs of their drugs are kind of over here. And if you look at that from a drug company's point of view, there doesn't seem to be an opportunity over here but the drug companies all have another big problem, um, and that's that nobody likes them. Everybody thinks they're evil. Um, these companies spend more on advertising than any other industry in the world, and it doesn't work. <laughs> nobody likes them at all. 
But Novartis looked at this piracy problem and looked at their advertising problem and, and they saw a way to kind of to use one to solve the other. They saw some, some space over here that was actually an opportunity for them. They noticed that in Thailand, one of their leukemia drugs was, was being copied and reverse engineered and the Thai government were not going to do anything about it. And so they went into Thailand and they just started producing the actual real Novartis, the, the actual patented drug, and they started putting the pirates out of business by giving away the drug for free everywhere where the pirates were selling it. And this worked really well for them. Everybody in Thailand was kind of happy with that, and they, Novartis started winning corporate social responsibility awards, and people started to talk about them in a different way. They noticed that suddenly they were being talked about as the socially responsible drug company, something that millions, billions of dollars of ad spend could, couldn't have done. Another example, handbags. Ha the handbag business is totally being, totally being ripped apart by piracy all the time. Um, a handbag designer I know in New York, uh, who lives down here near Canal Street, um, noticed that actually buying a fake handbag on Canal Street is a much, much more exciting experience than buying a real handbag a mile away in Soho. If you, if you go and buy a real handbag, you, you walk into a nice glass store and you give me a credit card and they give you a handbag. And, and it, with luxury products, you get most of your utility from them at the point of buying them. So why, the, the pirate experience is, is much, much better. Someone comes up to you and like, do you want to buy a handbag? And if you say yes, they take you off down, down a side street and there's like, you go into a shop and there's a false wall and you go up some stairs and then there's a little secret shop and you go in there and it's, a, it's so much fun buying, buying pirate handbags. Next time you're in New York, go and do that. Um, so Rachel Nasvik was really thought about, well, this is actually a better experience. It's really cool, kind of the thrill of the, thrill of the chase is what she called it. And last summer, she actually made a special line of these hot pink handbags. And she started leaving them on Canal Street in pirate handbag stores and even in hot dog stands and kind of anywhere she thought was interesting. And then she just put on her Twitter feed, oh, I've left some handbags here. And you'd just see armies of young women like running through New York. These handbags are like $700 in Barney's. And she's just putting on in the counterfeit stores and, saying, and telling the, the owners, sell these for about 10 bucks each. And they were, and these bags were huge. And she got so much press from doing this. And her orders went up in Barney's, and it, it really helped her. She, she pirated the Pirates handbag distribution network and made it work for her in the commercial space. So copying pirates is a really, really good way to think about, to think about this problem. And another thing to do is let the pirates copy you. This, is, this isn't a bad thing. We, we heard from uh, Kareem Siobhan earlier that all the stuff they were talking about with modding and Little Big Planet, the reason that the games industry is so dynamic is because people, because kids have just been stealing and ripping code from games and making their own stuff since the very beginning of gaming. The, the idea of remixing stuff is just, it, it, it's something we, we sort of understand in music. We understand the value. You hear a Kanye West record and you sample some old jazz record and then you turn on Jazz FM and you're oh yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, okay, I understand why that's back on the radio. Uh, but it, it's really in everything we do and it's how we think about innovation sort of everywhere. Like people look at the iPod, they think this is the most this is the most iconic original consumer product of the last decade, right? Or one of them for sure. But if you look at this thing, it's it's really a remix. It's a it's a mishmash of other other people's ideas. So Sony developed the hard drive, Toshiba Sony developed the battery, sorry, Toshiba developed the hard drive, a company called Pixo developed the operating system. And the design was all ripped off from the world's first portable music player, the Regency TR1 radio, which was released in 1954 in some similar colours and, and came with a, the song, see it, hear it, get it. It's kind of like Rip Mix Burn, right? So we all, understand, we all understand the value of copying other people in the remix, but the value of just letting people copy your own IP is still something we're kind of not really sure about. We're kind of like a little scared to do it at times. But it really adds value to, to originals, and you can see this in all, all these different industries and arenas. So, so Nike, again, a company, has big problems with people pirating their stuff all, all the time. There's counterfeits of, of all their different shoes, especially this one. This is the Air Force One. It was a basketball shoe released in 1982. It's the most sort of iconic shoe of the hip-hop generation, and for years people have been customizing these and coloring them in. Like, like it's kind of a coloring book, it's a blank canvas. And Nike sort of saw that and they responded, they started releasing their own 
colors and limited edition Air Force Ones, and now limited editions is just an industry standard in, in, the shoot, in the trainer business. It didn't stop one, one sneaker pirate, this, this hip hop DJ from Tokyo named Nigo from creating his own pirate copy of his shoe. He liked what Nike were doing with the Air Force One, but he thought, sort of from the context of hip hop, you could really take things a lot further. So he ripped off the swoosh logo, and he added his own shooting star logo from his fashion label with Bathing Ape. And he started releasing them in, in really garish colorways, like patent materials, things even Nike hadn't experimented with, but he kind of wanted to see in the marketplace. And he started releasing them in really small quantities, like 300 pairs at a time for about 300 pounds a pair each. And people went mad for these shoes. People loved what he was doing. And he's now got, I think, 20 stores across the world. And he sells these in all of them. And if you look at this from a legal point of view, there's clear examples of trademark and trade dress infringement. Nike could have absolutely gone after this guy and just sued him into a smoking hole in the ground. But they didn't. They, they actually looked at this as, as a remix and as healthy competition. And they were inspired by what Nigo was doing with his shoes to, to kind of take things further with the Air Force One. And because they thought like that, the Air Force One is, is still the world's most successful basketball shoe franchise some 25 years after it was originally released. And the, the CEO of Nike actually ended up buying shares in Bape, in the, in the pirate copies. So it adds value to originals to let remixes happen, but it also it creates new innovation. So there's no better example of this than in the games industry. And the story starts with this game. Some of you might know it. Castle Wolfenstein. It was released for the Apple II in 1981. Um, and it, in it, you play an allied spy shooting it out with the Nazis in a, in a German castle during World War II. That's kind of the story. And three 11-year-olds in the States were really into this game, really obsessed with it. Um, and the, the only thing they didn't really like about it was the whole kind of World War II vibe. They were weren't really threatened by Nazis. I, I guess they hadn't done that in history class yet or whatever. Um, but they found a back door into this game. This, this is the first time this ever happened. They found a way to sort of get into the code and manipulate it. And so they got inside Castle Wolfenstein and started playing around with it. And they created their own version of Castle Wolfenstein, a pirate version, if you like, which they called Castle Smurfenstein. They weren't scared of Nazis. They weren't scared of these little pixelated Nazis running around the castle. So they changed them all into Smurfs. And you'd go around this castle, and instead of being confronted with Nazis, you see these little blue and white killing machines, which would garble at you in Smurf talk before trying to riddle you with bullets. And they shared this on bulletin boards and on floppy disks with their friends. And Smurfenstein became a huge underground hit. People, kids looked at this thing, and suddenly they saw a video game as a blank canvas, as a, as a kind of coloring book that you could get inside and you could, you could play around with. And some of the kids who grew up playing Smurfenstein actually went on to become the, the leaders in the, in the gaming business. So a guy called John Carmack founded a company called Id, Id Software, I'm sure some of you know. Um, and they bought the rights to Castle Wolfenstein, and they, they created the world's first first-person shooter, Wolfenstein 3D. And as, as a little shout out to Smurfenstein, they actually made it so that you could, you could mod the game. You could, you could change the characters and the levels and all the rest of it. And this is when modding really started to sort of take off. And with f subsequent games that they released sort of from Doom to Quake, mod modding just became an industry standard. And now it's something that everybody in the gaming industry, uh, we heard earlier from the guys from uh, Molecule, the amount of people they've hired who were creating mods and doing all this stuff. And it's gone even further. You've got Machinima and people using games to create movies, using characters as from the games as actors and, and levels as backdrops and sets. You've got Red versus Blue, which is filmed entirely on location in Halo. Films like Sundown, made using Grand Theft Auto. MTV had the show Video Mods, which is mods of music, using music videos, games made from music videos, other way around. Anyway, Machinima Festivals. There's Machinima for Dummies. This is an entire new form of culture that started because in 1981, some kids found a back door into a video game. I think that's amazing. I think it's something we should celebrate and we should encourage in every industry. But remixes also generate demand, perpetually can generate demand. The fashion industry is one where, where piracy is, is a huge, huge problem. But the whole business is actually founded on the idea of copying. Without copying in fashion, 
We wouldn't have trends, we wouldn't have seasons, we wouldn't have any of this stuff. It, it works like this, you can, you can copyright your 2D design that you draw, but the moment you make a sample, a anybody else can look at that and think that's a good idea, I'll copy that. So someone comes up with skinny jeans, and other fashion designers say, oh, I like them, I think I'll, I'll make my own version of skinny jeans. And soon enough, there are skinny jeans all over the catwalk, so journalists are writing skinny jeans are the hot new thing, and suddenly celebrities are falling out of clubs drunk wearing skinny jeans, and before you know it, we're all wearing them like they're going out of fashion. And they do go out of fashion, and by the time you see skinny jeans in the bargain bin at Walmart, well, that's a market signal to fashion designers in Paris and London that it's probably time to move on. So copying can be a really, really important part of, of demand of all these things. But th there's things that pirates will never be able to copy. And if you're in a business where copying is a problem, I, you should take heart in the fact that if pirates are giving away something you do for free, there are things you can sell that they just cannot copy. So you can sell convenience. Think about, think about Windows Vista um, versus Linux. Anybody in here a Linux user? A few of you. The, the, those of you that aren't, go and talk to Linux users in the break about Linux. They will talk to you about how amazing it is with religious fervor. Linux users love, love this free open source software, and rightly so, it's amazing. It's revolutionizing all kinds of businesses and saving millions of dollars for all kinds of industries and governments. Then go and read some reviews online of Windows Vista. Nobody likes Windows Vista. It totally sucked. It was awful. It was horrible. But there are a lot more people using Windows Vista than there are using Linux, even though Linux is free and wonderful and Vista is expensive and crap. Because we just kind of, it's more convenient. You don't, we don't, I mean, I'm sorry to say this at an education conference, we don't like learning. We don't want to learn. We want things to be easy in the, the, like we used to, like the computer at work, like the one at home. I don't, know, I don't understand Linux, I don't want to use it. Convenience is a really, really good thing to sell if you can get into that position. Trust is something else we can, we can, we can sell. Think about iTunes versus things like BitTorrent. This just doesn't work iTunes has pulled down more than five billion in revenue when every single song on there is available a click away for free, often at better quality. But a lot of people are never ever gonna wanna use BitTorrent because they don't trust it or they don't understand it or they got a virus off LimeWire or whatever it is. We just don't, we don't wanna interact with things. Some people even wanna pay musicians for their work. I know, novel these days. Um, experience, you can sell experiences. Think about bottled water. This is an $8 billion a year industry in the US where 42% of the bottled water is actually dirtier than the tap water there. It makes no sense, but we're not, we're not, buying, we're not buying water, we're buying the French Alps or Health or Vitality or, or whatever they're selling us on the label, like a nice font. Um, Hollywood, think about Hollywood. This is a business being ripped apart by piracy. I, I live in New York City and I work um, on Canal Street, which is kind of the capital of of piracy in, Holly, in New York. And if you go and talk to some of the, the DVD pirates who are on the street selling all the latest releases, go and talk to them, ask them how business is, and they'll all be like, yeah, it's not great. People are downloading movies at home. You know, we're ruined. When the pirate DVD sellers are complaining about piracy, <laughs> you know that industry is, is in trouble, right? But, but it's not the case. The last three years in a row have been the best years in the history of Hollywood at the box office, and, and DVDs and, and that whole thing is changing, but people are still going to movies in droves because there's no better way to sit with a girl in the dark for two hours on a first date. But, I mean, Hollywood's learning, and, and we're all kind of learning as things sort of fragment and break up, that actually a, a really smart way to sort of combat piracy is if pirates are giving away your stuff free in all different places, it's, it's not about necessarily trying to shut them down everywhere, but sometimes the smart thing is actually, actually to, to create lots of different opportunities for people to pay you and lots of different ways for them to pay you. And I, I think about this as creating, creating virtuous circles, creating kind of a feedback loop where, where people interact with your story in a number of different ways, and in some, in some cases they'll pay you for access to that story, and in some, some they won't. So this is something we're seeing with TV. TV, again, being decimated by pirates, all these pirate TV sites. So all the studios got together and they started Hulu, and Hulu's making more money than YouTube per user, and it's doing really well. But the way that we consume, the way that we consume Hulu is different from the way that we consume TV. It's not this top-down relationship where you, we're, we're broadcasting. 
TV on Hulu is in the middle of a conversation. It's in the middle of lots of people's networks and they're talking about the things they're watching and sending links to people and, and all the rest of it. So the way that we're watching things has really changed and some TV shows and creators of TV shows have responded by changing the way that they tell, tell these stories. So Heroes is, is a good example. This is the most pirated TV show on BitTorrent sites and Tim Kring, the creator of Heroes and the producers there, actually started telling the story in a different way to combat this. They started this idea of transmedia storytelling, of telling a story across various platforms in different ways at the same time. So the way it works with Heroes is the TV show is kind of the, the still the anchor, it's the flagship part of the franchise, but then you've got merch and you've got them selling other parts of the story and toys and all the rest of it that's, that's kind of pretty normal publishing. A any storylines that are kind of too too big or get edited from the show turn up in a comic that they sell. They sell a physical version through DC Comics and they give it away as a PDF every month online. And then you've got webisodes and other storyline extensions on NBC.com, things on Hulu, they're licensing things to other places and they're selling integrated advertising against all of this. Heroes makes between 50 and 100 million dollars a season from all of this stuff, not including TV ad revenue just off people interacting with this stuff online. And a lot of that is being driven by people downloading it from BitTorrent and then going to look for more of it somewhere else. So creating these virtuous circles where you sort of create a feedback loop between the pirates and what you're doing in your audience, I think is a really smart way. And it's kind of a, it's, it's how we need to think about organizing in the 21st century. If you're facing a complex problem, you can't just, you can't just say, no, piracy is wrong and kind of hit, hit kids with a hammer or it's, you've got to come with a complex solution, with a systems level solution, where you change everything around, around behavior and around what people are doing. But the hard thing about a virtuous circle and creating one of these is, is kind of knowing when you're outside of the circle and knowing when you've taken all of, the, all of the things into account. The thing that hasn't been taken into account here, and the thing we're all still really struggling with, is, is the idea of user-generated content. And I'm going to leave you one story about user-generated content, which I think we all need to understand as, as companies, and that's you should never let the legal team ruin a good remix without talking to marketing first, because I, I see this problem a lot. Um, a good example, um, die, the Die Hard films. So 2006, Fox are releasing Die Hard 4, and the marketing team are sitting around scratching their heads. How do we get people excited about the, the previous three Die Hard films online? How do we kind of reignite that? And they're not coming up with much, and they're sitting there twiddling their thumbs. Um, little did they know that a, a band, a comedy rock band called Guys Night, had just released a song called Die Hard, where the band sings this plot synopsis of the first three Die Hard films. Um, it doesn't sound very funny, but actually it is. Remember when we first met John McClane? Argyle picked him up from the plane And took him down to Nakatomi Tower To meet with Holly He came to get her back and to be her man But Hans and his buddies fucked up the plan And that's about when everything went sour At the Christmas party And the terrorists were over zealous But it was sweet when they killed Ellis And with the lip Can you cut that? Sorry, I can't show you anymore for legal reasons. But go on YouTube and check it out. Can I show you 30 seconds? I'm sorry, it's the law. Um, so anyway, they created, this, they created this, this video and four million people watched it. It's really funny, you should check the whole thing out. And it was, it was a huge success. It was one of these runaway videos and um, the marketing team at Fox had no idea. The legal team, however, did find out about it. And they did their jobs. They did what they paid to go in and do. They, they called YouTube and they, they sent a letter to the band saying, look, we own, the, we own the copyright to all these video clips you've used. Can you please, can you take this down? And the band took it down and thought that was the end of that and went back to writing songs. A Couple of weeks later, the marketing team at Fox hear about this amazing video that everybody's been watching online. They find out who made it and they phone Guys Night. Guys Night pick up the phone. Hi, we're from Fox. How much money do we have to pay you to put that video you made on YouTube? <laughs> so they put it back up. They paid Guys Night. Guys Night played at the premiere of Die Hard 4, and everything was great. And it's just, it's, it's these kind of, this cognitive dissonance we have. Like, from a marketing perspective, we kind of understand the value of all this stuff now. But from a legal perspective, and this other part of our brains or organizations, we're just kind of not getting it. Um, my favorite line in Die Hard, 
is when Hans Gruber, the evil terrorist played by Alan Rickman, um, he, he's, he's talking to Holly McLean, Bruce Willis's fictional wife, and she says to him, you're nothing but a common thief. And he looks really offended and he turns to her and he says, I'm an exceptional thief, Mrs. McLean. And I think this is the difference that we don't understand because yes, there are examples of common thievery and stealing and, and things that we need to have laws against, but there is also this exceptional new form of, of stealing, which is, is actually driving creativity and it's something we should be encouraging. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the Pirate's Dilemma. Thank you very much. Uh, that's brilliant. Thank you. Good. Can you take some questions? Yeah, sure. But, um, yeah. Jud judging by your tweets, which you weren't witnessing there, Matt, um, you like what Matt had to say there. Um, there are parts of the publishing world where Matt would be burnt at the stake for being a heretic. Um, there are parts of the publishing world where they would burn me at the stake for being a heretic. I, I wasn't going to be political in any way today, but I appear to be one of two MPs who is opposing the clauses in the Digital Economy Bill that Matt is uh, so vexed for. So um, if you get a chance to write to your MP to get them to oppose it as well, we might make some progress. And what I thought, what I, thought I've, I took a couple of things from what you said there, Matt. Firstly, uh, I didn't realise 20th Century Fox was um, founded by a pirate, uh, subsequently bought by a bandit. Uh, that's a political comment as well, sorry about that. Um, and, and you may not be aware of some of the debates we've had in the Commons over copyright reform over the years. There's a great man called Lord Macaulay, who when Parliament was first discussing copyright in the 1840s, made a brilliant contribution that I've been reading to help me understand the digital economy, but where he said copyright is a necessary evil a temporary monopoly bespo uh, bestowed on an individual to get others to enter a market. And from that, point, from that point of view, we've developed a sort of idea of property rights around copyright, which I, for one, think uh, a new generation of citizens are not going to accept as part of their copyright settlement. And so when he talks about the challenges that we, um, that we face over copyright reform, you're not kidding, Matt. And what, one example before I take questions. I always look at J.D. Salinger. I read, you know, we must have all read Catcher in the Rye. I read it, and I thought, you know, what a great man J.D. Salinger is, but he only wrote one book, and then he moved to a ranch in the middle of nowhere and dined out on the book for the rest of his life. And I think, well, if you're a coal miner, and you spent six months down a pit and dug all that coal up and then came up six months later and said, well, I've dug all that coal up, I just, I'm going to buy a ranch, I don't have to do any more, you, you wouldn't think it was very productive. And so, you know, there is a sort of, a sort of countervailing view uh, uh, of copyright that I think is emerging. Anyway, that's my rant. Any questions to Matt? I've silenced you all, I'm sorry about that. I was so enthused by what you had to say there, Matt. Anyone take account of you? Anyone agree with him? Hands in the air. Okay, I think you've got the audience, Matt, <laughs> if not any other questions. Got, got some over here. Can, can we get you a, a mic first, Simon? Okay, and then we'll get the gentleman behind you. Hi there, Matt. Hello. Hi, Matt. Um, just a quick one. Um, are you happy for us to photocopy your book? Yeah, you can. Of course, please photocopy my book. Um, you can actually go onto my website, thepiratesdilemma.com, and you can download a free copy, or you can pay whatever you like, because my view of the of the digital copy was I'm not really sure what it's worth, but it was probably worth giving away to people if they didn't want to buy it. And what I found by doing that is, I think it's around 10 to 15 percent of people who take who grab a copy actually end up paying five dollars or more on average, which is great. But the real value for me as a as an author is the amount of opportunities that that's created for me in terms of marketing. Um, Last summer was probably one of my favourites. Um, I got an email from Jay-Z's recording engineer, a guy called Young Guru, whose name I knew from liner notes of hip-hop albums for like the last 10 years. It's like, hey, can you come in and talk to us about Jay-Z going independent and stuff? And I was invited into the studio, and I said, how did you find the book? He said, well, I saw, I saw a link to the PDF on this hip-hop blog that I read. 
So I grabbed it and I started reading it, but I don't like reading books on my laptop. So I went to Barnes and Noble and I bought every copy they had and I put one in Jay-Z's hand and said, you need to read this. And I did one, gave one to Kanye West and said, you need to read this. And I put one in every hand of every top executive at Def Jam Records. My, my publishers, there's no amount of money they could have spent to, to make that happen. I mean, they both let, let me do the free book thing, which was great, but yeah, it's, piracy's worked really well for the book. Gentlemen here. Hi, um, what, uh, there's a big movement in, in internationally now for, uh, uh, to put out educational resources online for free, uh, which I'm a, a mm. great supporter of. And just endorsing what you're saying in terms of the business model that's emerging for, the, for that, particularly the OU in the UK has seen massive interest in other uh, aspects of their educational offering. The business model has changed. So I'm suggesting perhaps we should put all our educational con content online available for free. Quite controversial, but. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, it, it, it's one of these situations where a rising tide would definitely lift all boats and MIT Open Courseware and all of these things going on with education are really, really encouraging. I mean, if people are getting more access to education, that's ultimately better for all of us. So yeah, we're gonna probably need some new business models around that, but I mean, it's an opportunity. It's a great opportunity. So. Okay, any other questions before we break? No? Okay, inspiring speaker. Can Thank you, you very much. Of course? Thank you. That's fine. That's brilliant. Okay. Oh, are you saying around for lunch? Yeah. yeah.